I'm gonna be honest, it took a little bit longer than expected, but finally we can finish off episode 1 of Ari Fudeta's cut content. So, starting from where we left off last episode, Hajime awakes to find himself partly submerged in a small river. Wondering how he survived the fall, he looks up to see that there were a series of waterfalls that created a stream towards his current location. He figured that he must have been swept up by these waterfalls and just followed the current down. It took him a while to get up, but once he did, he warmed himself and dried his clothes using the basic flare spell, a task that was a lot harder for him than you'd think. He then made his way through the twisting tunnels of this unexplored cave. It was a whole lot different in comparison to the rectangular passageways of the upper floors, so he really had no idea what he was doing or where he was going. Eventually, he came across the rabbit, which after taking out the two wolves, Hashime thought it to be much stronger than the behemoth on the 65th floor. At least the behemoth's moves were predictable. As for the rabbit, it was far too quick for his eyes to even follow. Everything after this point, up till Hajime transmutes himself into a hole, is pretty much the same. So if we start from there, we see that Hajime has passed out after using too much mana, only to wake up feeling revitalized after drinking drops of liquid from what's called a divinity stone. These are large clumps of mana that pool together and crystallized over the course of a thousand years. Then after a few hundred more, the saturation of mana will start to liquefy and pour back into the earth. This liquid was known as ambrosia, and it could heal any and all wounds, supposedly even extend one's life so long as they continue to drink it, thus granting it the name of the elixir of life. Legends claim that even Ahit used ambrosia to heal the masses, though there was a couple things that the ambrosia couldn't heal, severed limbs, hunger, and thirst. This is important to know because it had been four days since Hajime fell from the bridge, and because he was too scared to leave the hole that he was hiding in, he hadn't eaten since. Sure, the ambrosia would heal any physical damage, but it couldn't remove the pain or sensation of hunger and thirst. It became this brutal cycle in and out of consciousness, as his pain would constantly wake him up any time his fatigue brought him to sleep. All he could do was stay awake with his thoughts, thinking, why did this happen to me? Six more days went by, and his thoughts of why me slowly turned darker and darker. He began to question why no one was coming for him, why he had to be betrayed, why he had to suffer for their sake. All he wanted to do was live, and he began to think that anyone who would hinder that simple mindset was the enemy. Feelings of anger and hatred began to fill his mind for days on end, but soon after that they slowly began to fade. He began to see how it was pointless to be trapped over such petty feelings. He knew that no matter how much he raged, it would neither stop the pain nor get him out of this situation. Finally, all of these emotions began to fade from his heart. Even his feelings towards the one person who treated him kindly began to serve no purpose within him. The only feeling that bubbled to the surface was this urge to survive. A will that turned to resolve, and a resolve that formed itself into a sharp point that would cut past anything in its path. It brought forth this desire to kill, though not one that was based off of hostility. No, this was all for the sake of living. Anyone who threatened his life was an enemy, and any enemy had to be killed. It was at this point that the former Hajime ceased to exist. The one who would put himself in danger for the sake of others. The one who Kaiori had come to adore that person was gone. What was left was a new Hajime that was willing to slaughter anything that stood in his path, though he knew he was too weak to simply challenge the monsters that inhabited this floor. What he needed now was to train. Given that he had an infinite supply of mana sitting right next to him, he trained his transmutation skills 24-7, working on speed, precision, and range, mastering everything there was to know about this basic ability that he was given. After days of training his abilities, they had actually vastly improved, and he was now able to transmute from a distance of over 3 meters away. Unfortunately, simply creating pitfalls filled with spikes wouldn't be enough to kill these high-leveled monsters. You see, the stronger a monster, the tougher their hide. Swords or knives wouldn't be enough to pierce their skin. Hajime had to think outside the box, so he created a drill and used that as a way to penetrate the hides of the monsters he trapped. At long last, Hajime had food, and he feasted for hours on the flesh of the monsters he had slain. But just like we saw in the anime, by the end of it, it had caused nothing but pain. The only thing that kept him alive was the constant intake of ambrosia. This phenomenon that Hajime was currently going through was known as overcompensation. Put simply, it's when the body needs to adjust itself because it can't compensate for the changes happening inside of it. Hajime was experiencing overcompensation because it's a known fact that monster meat is poisonous to humans. 
It's because the mana crystals within their blood allow the monster's organs to directly interface with magic, giving them their superior physical strength since mana literally flows through their veins. This mana can't be ingested by humans, because it would destroy their cells from the inside out. The human body simply isn't capable of handling it. Numerous people had attempted in the past, and all died. The only reason Hajime survived was because of the ambrosia he drank to constantly repair his dying cells. So what we saw was Hajime's body being constantly broken and repaired, until finally his frail body was forced to transform into something stronger. His screams of pain were akin to the cries of a newborn baby. And just like that, after those excruciating moments, Hajime was reborn, both physically and mentally. His hunger faded and the pain from his missing arm subsided. In fact, he felt no pain at all, just much lighter and overwhelmed by the newfound power flowing within him. When he looked at his body, he saw that he was much more built, and even a little bit taller, at least 10 centimeters taller. Wondering what happened to him, he focused on his arms to see these strange dark veins floating above the rest. Thinking about how gross they looked, he joked about how it was as if he turned himself into a monster. Then he remembered he could just check his status plate to see his stats. And when he pulled it up, he saw an exponential increase in pretty much everything, plus an additional three skills of mana manipulation, iron stomach, and lightning field. What's interesting to note though is that Hajime only went up to level 8 which, comparatively speaking, is rather low. You see, a person's level represented the proportion of total potential that they had reached, and since max level was 100, that meant that Hajime could get significantly more powerful, especially since his stats were already so high at only level 8. Mana manipulation does pretty much as the name states. It gives him the ability to control mana. So, having a general idea of what this did, he attempts to transmute something to test it out. As he thought, he was able to manipulate the terrain without even the need for an incantation, a trait only possible to monsters up until now. Hajime had acquired the power that was unique only to monsters, and not just their mana manipulation either, their other skills as well. There was no instructions on how they worked though, so it took a bit of time to figure out how to use the ones like Lightning Field. Eventually he learned that he had to create a mental image of what he was trying to do in order to activate the skill. So, by imagining static electricity in his head, red lightning began to trail from his fingertips and wrap itself around his body. Although he couldn't fire it like a projectile, he could transfer it via direct contact. It was a pretty useful skill, so he practiced it until he could easily adjust the flow of current and the level of voltage that he could produce. Iron Stomach also did as the name suggests. It basically allowed him to eat monster food without going through the hellish pain he went through the first time. With this, he could finally enjoy a semi-decent meal, especially since now he can even cook the food with his lightning field abilities. Now, although he was certain that he had the power to take on the bear, he decided to play it safe and spend a few more days polishing his new skills. This resulted in the unlocking of a derivative skill to his transmutation, known as Ore Appraisal, a very high-level skill that was rare even among the most royal blacksmiths, so rare that it was by definition impossible to innately possess. Only after years of rigorous transmutation training could one obtain this skill. A bit of context to this is that appraisal magic was generally far more complex than offensive magic. It required suitably large magic circles to activate. Only academic facilities or large institutions were known to have had appraisal magic circles. Appraisal skills, on the other hand, gave the users the ability to appraise anything within their domain of analysis, all with a small magic circle and a simple incantation. All they had to do was touch the target. Hajime knew the significance and rarity of this skill, so he used it to appraise every single ore that he could find. Green Glowstone, Blast Rock, Tar Stone, each revealed their own unique properties, and the more ores he appraised, the more ideas that Hajime came up with for his weapons. For example, Blast Rock was a combustible ore. When exposed to fire, it'll burn like oil until it becomes nothing but cinders. With enough blast rock confined to a small space, lighting it will cause an explosion, and with enough quantity and pressure, you could create flames as strong as those created by fire magic. Hajime saw that this ore was very similar to gunpowder, and he immediately knew what he wanted to create. He spent days trying to craft the weapon that he envisioned, and after thousands of failed attempts, he was finally able to make himself a revolver. The gun itself was made of tar stone, a hard black rock that ranks 8 on the Mohs scale of hardness. The bullets were also made from this ore. With these, the general idea was to use the blast rock's combustion to propel the bullets. 
Then, with his lightning field skill, he would electrically accelerate his shots like a railgun, essentially making his bullets pack more punch than an anti-tank rifle. So, with this revolver's creation, Hajime, a simple synergist, had just brought modern weaponry into this fantasy world. It was time to go hunting now, and rabbits were next on the menu. After figuring out that eating the same monster twice didn't make him stronger, he tried to find as many different ones as he could. Once he had finished eating the rabbit, he checked his stats to see that they had improved significantly again, with even more skills and derivative skills showing up. Air Dance was one of them, so he decided to test that first. When he rushed forward, he moved so fast that everything became a blur. That was likely due to the supersonic step derivative skill, so he tried making a mental image of how he thought it should be. When he leaped forward, he basically teleported face first into a wall. It would seem that controlling his acceleration was a lot harder than he thought, but with enough training, he knew he could become faster than even the rabbit. The next test was for aerodynamics. This allowed him to create footholds in mid-air. Not quite invisible platforms, but something similar. Now, even with these supposedly OP new skills, he still wasn't 100% sure that he could easily defeat the bear. He wanted to leave nothing up to chance, leave no room for any enemy to be stronger than him. So he kept training, day after day until he was a master of every single one of his skills. After enough time, Hajime became capable of easily traversing the dungeon at lightning speeds, using his aerodynamics to guide himself around tight corners. With this mobility, he could have easily searched for an exit. I mean, if getting out was his main concern, then that would have been the best option. But Hajime was driven by revenge. He wasn't going to leave the labyrinth until he killed that bear. He felt he wouldn't be able to move forward unless he proved that he was much more than a match for the monster that broke him in the past. This was now a revenge match. Eventually, he was able to find the claw bear as it was feasting on some rabbits. Wanting to set the stage as a rival rather than prey, he quickly aims and shoots at it. Unfortunately, the bear could sense Hajime's bloodlust, and it reflexively dodged the bullet, causing it to only graze its shoulder. However, the stage was now set, and the bear knew that Hajime wasn't merely food, he was an enemy. In the novel, the bear was able to trade a couple of blows with Hajime. After firing five of his six shots, only three had managed to hit. Now, the bear wasn't so dumb as to give Hajime a chance to reload, so Hajime had to bring out another one of his tools, a makeshift flashbang that incorporated the ore green glowstone. The principle behind it was actually rather simple. We know that green glowstone absorbs mana to emit a faint green light, but what the ore appraisal showed further was that when this ore breaks, the light within it will explode all at once in a big flash. So what Hajime did was take a green glowstone, fill it to the brim with mana, then package it with a small fuse leading all the way to the center where a small blast rock would be found. Then all he had to do was light the fuse and three seconds later his homemade flashbang would explode. With the bear now disoriented by the light, Hajime fired his last round to take the bear's arm clean off. This was exactly what he wanted, because now he could eat that arm in front of the bear, just like how the bear had done to him. In the words of Nux, it was a pretty big flex. I mean, when the bear saw this, it began to cower in fear since up until now, it had never encountered a foe that was stronger than it. Hajime had planned for this to happen, but what he didn't account for was the sharp pain he would get from eating that bear's arm. He thought that with his iron stomach ability, it would be just like eating the meat of the wolves or the rabbits. He didn't realize that the bear was a different species from them, and absorbing its power brought with it a new wave of pain. When the bear saw Hajime struggling, it knew it had an opportunity to charge, but as we saw, Hajime used his lightning field to immobilize it, then finished it off once and for all with his gun. Hajime was expecting there to be this rush of joy after defeating this foe that he hated so much, but in actuality, he didn't enjoy the fighting at all. In fact, he just wanted to avoid pain. He wanted to eat his fill, survive, and continue living. It's here he realized that after everything, he just wanted to go home. That's all he cared about. So he swore to himself that by his own hands, he would find his way back home. And if anyone should stand in his way, then they too would meet the same fate as this bear. Anyway, that's pretty much everything skipped from episode one. Now, as much as I'd like to finish the entire season, I just don't think it's possible. It would take at least 30 cut contents. On top of that, the new season's already started, and with that comes a different set of content. 
Yes, I know, I committed to more than I could actually handle this season, and I'm sorry if you only watched me for this type of stuff, but unfortunately, I'm gonna have to put this specific hood content on hold. That doesn't mean it might not return, it just means that, for now, I can't set aside the time to work on this anime specifically. I really hope you guys understand. Anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!